Hello everyone, my name is Nikola Marincic. Welcome to another class of our course, an introduction to machine intelligence for architects and other non-engineers. We are currently in week number eight. Last time we had some linear algebra, and what I promised you is that with linear algebra we will be able to make our neural network code more concise, more effective, and more flexible. So let's see how we can do this. This is the neural network that we implemented without using any linear algebra at all. And the task for today is to implement this neural network by using linear algebra, by using vectors, matrices, and operation on vectors and matrices. Before we start doing this, let's warm up with the exercise number 11. So we have our exercise 11, which is about building a neural network using matrices step by step. So the first task is to learn about some additional vector and matrix manipulation functions. Before we can do that, let's run this code where we initialize our libraries. So A is a matrix defined as following. So this is the code and this is the printout of the matrix. So it, you can see it's two by four matrix. And um, here I'm asked, what is the shape of this matrix? So matrix A, if I type dot shape, I will get that this matrix has two rows and four columns. Now the task is transform this matrix so that its rows become its columns and the columns its rows. So we could reinstantiate this matrix by making this into rows and for example one and zero into columns, but there is an easier way to do this. There is a mathematical operation which exactly does that. And this mathematical operation is called transpose function. So we can use the transpose function also in NumPy. If I type A, I get the original matrix. And if I do A dot uh, capital letter T, I get the transpose matrix. So if you can see here, the first row was 1, 3, 5, negative 1. And now the first column is 1, 3, 5, negative 1. So this is very easy to do. Now it asks me, what is the shape of the transposed matrix A? So if I type A dot T, I get the transpose matrix, and if I type dot shape, I get that the shape is 4, 2. This means that this matrix has four rows and two columns, which is exactly the opposite than the original matrix, which had two rows and four columns. Now it says B is a six-dimensional row vector. All right, let's see what that means. Well, it is a vector because it has only one dimension, and it has six numbers, so it has six dimensions. The task is to reshape this vector into a 3 by 2 matrix. Well, first of all, each vector can be represented as a matrix. In these terms, B would be a vector that has six columns and one row. So to reshape this vector, I can type B and then use the function reshape, open parenthesis, and put the shape, for example, 3, 2. When I do that, I get the resulting vector, which has values 1 and 0, so this is this 1 and this 0. Then in the next row, I have this 1 and this 0, which are, which are these two. And then finally, I have this 1 and 0. If I ask the shape, you will see that this is actually 3, 2 shape, so 3 rows and 2 columns. So we successfully did this. Now it says reshape the vector B into a 6 times 1 matrix. So what we do is the same, reshape, except we now put 6, 1. And what we get? We actually get a column vector. So we get a vector whose numbers are arranged in a single column. So six times one. Now let's see how we can restructure this neural network that we are about to implement. So our general strategy is to see what are the roles in a neural network? What are the common roles that we can identify? And then how to um, organize these functions within different layers. So let's first see what layers do we have. So we have the layer one, which is the input layer. We will call it layer one from now. We will not call it input, hidden and output layer anymore. We will name these layers by using numbers. So this is the layer one, this is the layer two, this is the layer three, and this is the cost function. Traditionally, we do not think about cost function as a layer of a neural network, but I think it's a good idea because it does act as a layer when you visualize it in this way. It does come after the last layer. What are the main classes of elements that we can find in a neural network? Well, the first one I would say are the weights. And now let's see what kind of weights do we have within our layers. So in the first layer, we have our data points. 
So there are no weights associated with these data points. Our data points are not multiplied by any kind of weights. They are not parameterized. Let's see what we have in the layer number two. We have weights A1 and B1 belonging to the first neuron. We have weights A2 and B2 belonging to the second neuron. And we have weights A3 and B3 belonging to the third neuron of the second layer. When we go to the third layer, we have A4, B4, and C4 being the weights of the first neuron. A5, B5, and C5 belonging to the second neuron. Do we have some weights in the cost function? Well, no, we are not really multiplying any of the elements by some weight. We are actually subtracting elements. What are the next type of elements within a neural network? Well, we have biases. Do we have some biases within the layer 1? Well, no, we don't have anything except our data points. Let's go to the layer 2. In the layer 2, we do have three biases. Bias C1 belonging to the first neuron, bias C2 belonging to the second neuron, and bias C3 belonging to the third neuron. Okay, let's go to the layer 3. What biases do we have there? We have two biases, D4 belonging to the first neuron and D5 belonging to the second neuron. Do we have some biases in the cost function? Well, not really. What other elements do we have? Well, we have outputs of the layers of our neural network, and we call these outputs activations. So do we have some activations within the layer one? Well, sure, we have our data points. We have X belonging to the first neuron and Y belonging to the second neuron. Well, let's go to the layer two. What activations do we have there? Well, we have outputs of our neurons one, two, and three. So the N1 belonging to the first neuron, N2 belongs to the second neuron, and N3 belongs to the third neuron. They are the outputs of the corresponding neurons. Let's check the layer number three. What outputs do we have there? Well, we have our outputs O1, belonging to the first neuron, and O2 belonging to the second neuron. Finally, do we have some activations or outputs within the cost function? Well, yes, sure we do. We have C1, which is the output of the first neuron, we have C2, which is the output of the second neuron, and then we have total cost, which is the ultimate uh, activation or the output of the cost cost function, giving us how bad our neural network performs, and this is calculated by adding C1 and C2. What other roles do we have in our neural network? Well, we have weighted sums. They come just before the activations. Do we have some weighted sums within the layer 1? Well, no. There is nothing except activations in the layer 1. In the layer 2, we have the same number of weighted sums as we have activations, so we have three of them. P1 belonging to the first neuron, P2 belonging to the second neuron, and P3 belonging to the third neuron. It is exactly the same story in the layer number 3. We have the same number of weighted sums as we have activations. So we have weighted sums Z1 belonging to the first neuron, and Z2 belonging to the second neuron. Do we have some weighted sums in the cost function? Well, no, there are no weighted sums there. And the only thing left for us to note are the labels. So where do labels belong? Well, I would say that they belong within the cost function, because this is the only place where we actually use them to compute something. And what labels do we have? Well, we have label with the index 0 and the label with the index 1. This would be all the elements that we have in our neural networks. What we can realize now is that the way we named our elements of our neural network was very useful when we used these elements one by one to compute the forward and backward paths. But when you think in terms of structure, this is really not ideal. So look at the weights. We have A's, B's, C's. In biases, we have C's and D's. In activations, we have X, Y, N1, N2, O1, O2, C1. And in weighted sums, we have P's and Z's. So, in terms of structure, this is not a very good naming strategy. We need to name our elements appropriately according to the function that they play in the neural network. So, let's do that next. Let's start by renaming weights. And we will go uh, row by row through our names to see what they can tell us about the location of these elements within our neural network. When we look at the names within the first row, we can realize that they actually belong to the first neuron. When we look at the elements of the second row, we can see that they belong to the second neuron, and consequently, elements belonging to the third row belong to the third neuron. And this is the case for both layers 2 and 3. We can use this ordering property to actually rename the elements, and now renamed all the weights with a small letter w and with a number which defines to which neuron of their corresponding layer they belong. But the problem is, now we have multiple weights which have the same name. So let's then look at these elements from the perspective of columns. 
let's see what columns tell us about these specific weights. Well, I now marked the weights W1, W2 and 3 in the first column. And what do they actually do? Well, they multiply the activation of the first neuron of the previous layer. If we look at the layer number 3 and the elements W1 and W2, you will see that they do exactly the same. So they multiply the activation of the neuron 1 of the previous layer, layer 2. Let's now go to the second column to see if we have something consistent. Well, the elements of the second column actually multiply the activations of the second neuron in the previous layer. And the same is the case with the layer number 3. These elements also multiply the second neuron of the previous layer. And when we look at the elements of the third column, we can realize that these elements actually multiply the activations of the third neuron of the layer 2. And you, we can use these properties of ordering to actually rename all of our weights in all of our layers. If we take out one weight from our network, for example, W21, let's see what this naming now means. Well, the first number, 2, indicates that this is a weight of the second neuron. And the second number indicates that this weight multiplies the activation of the first neuron in the previous layer. Well, the only thing that we do not know when looking at this weight is to which layer does this weight belongs. So we need to additionally note the layer membership of this weight. So we can do this by using the symbol which indicates in which layer does this element belong. Well, in this particular case, this weight belongs to the third layer, so we can note it as L3. Let's now try to rename our biases. This is going to be simpler than doing weights. So let's look at all of the biases from the perspective of the rows. So in the first row we have C1 and D4, and they both belong to the first neuron of their respective layer. The elements of the second row belong to the second neuron, and the elements of the third row belong to the third neuron. Okay, so we can use this ordering now to rename the biases. We will use the small letter B and a number which indicates to which neuron do they belong and a symbol which tells us to which layer do these biases belong. So if we look at the element B2 of the L2, this tells us that this is the bias of the second neuron which belongs in the second layer. Let's now rename our activations. If you look at all of the elements of the first row, you will realize that they belong to the first neuron of their respective layer. Elements of the second row belong to the second neuron, and elements of the third row, they belong to the third neuron of the respective layer. So we can use this ordering to now rename all the activations consistently. So we have the small letter A, and we have a number indicating to which neuron they belong, and we have a symbol indicating to which layer they belong. So if we take out the element A1 of the L3, this tells us that this is an activation of the first neuron that belongs in the third layer. The weighted sums, we can do the same thing as the activations. We will just name them with the symbol Z. And we can also accordingly rename our labels. We will rename them into Y1 and Y2. And this is the same neural network that we had before, it's just now we have renamed all of these elements consistently. This visualization on the left is a classical way of representing neural networks. And let's try to see where do weights, biases and activations actually show up on this image. Well, first of all, we can name neurons in the same way as we name activations or biases. For example, neuron 1 of the L2 means that this is the first neuron of the layer 2. Neuron 2 L3 means that this is a second neuron of the third layer. And now we can also represent weights on this image. You can see they belong to their respective neuron, but they actually multiply the activations of the layer before. When we look at biases, we can realize that there is only one bias term per neuron, so we can put it in the center of this neuron. And activations, these are actually the outputs of our neurons, which always lead to the neurons of the next layer. We are now ready to start computing the forward pass. So with this old image, let's first try to remind ourselves how we used to do this before. So to compute the weighted sums of the layer 2, what we needed to compute are the elements P1, P2, 
and P3. So P1 was equal to A1 times X plus B1 times Y plus C1. And it is a similar situation with P2 and P3. Okay, let's now do the same thing, but with our new naming convention. So now we have again three expressions here, but they are now in terms of Z1, Z2, and Z3 of the second layer. As you can see, this now looks more complicated because we have same elements repeating with just different subscripts and superscripts. But in fact, this is the exactly same calculation that we had before. Our goal in this class is to represent these operations by using vectors and matrices. So let's try to write these expressions in terms of vectors. So how can we represent, for example, elements Z1, Z2, and Z3 of the layer 2? Well, we can put them in a 3 by 1 matrix, which is the same as one vector containing three elements, Z1, Z2, and Z3. Well, we can do the same with the other elements here. So we have one weighted sum, which we can also put in a 3 by 1 matrix, and we have a matrix or a vector of biases of the second layer, so B1, B2, and B3. And they're all of the same size. This is why we are able to make now the equality. So we can say that the first vector is equal to the sum of the second and third. So our vectors containing weighted sums and biases are as clear as they, they can be, but we have something going on in the middle. So for example, we have some weighted sums here and they multiply, as you can see, same numbers, A1 in this case and A2 in the other case. So this looks like something we have seen before when learning about linear algebra. This to me actually looks like a matrix product. So our goal now is to represent this vector as a matrix product of weights and activations. So let's see how we can do this. Well, first of all, what is the size of this vector or matrix? Well, it is a three times one matrix, which means this is a vector with three elements. If this is a product matrix A times B, then what would be the sizes of the matrices A and B that enter this product? And this is what we did last time. So we know that the first matrix A must have three rows, and we know that the second matrix has to have one column. But what we don't know is what is the number of columns of the first matrix, which should be equal to the number of rows of the second matrix. This is something we do not know. But what can help us is to realize that we have actually six weights and two activations. Well, if we have six weights that we need to organize into three rows, then this would mean that we should have two columns. And if we have two columns, this means that these are the two rows of the matrix B. And two by one matrix B could actually store our activations A1 and A2. So let's try to do this. Let's try to assume that we have two matrices, three times two and two times one. So how should we then fill the elements of this matrix? Well, if you know what matrix multiplication is about, and you should know if you watched the last lecture, then you would know how to actually fill out these elements. So we have W11, W12, W21, W22, W33, and W32 organized in three rows and two columns. And in the next matrix, we have A1 of the L1 and A2 of the L1. As you can see, when you multiply these two matrices, you actually get the matrix on the top. And in this arrangement of weights, what would rows and columns mean? So the first row means these are the weights belonging to the neuron 1. The second row means these are the weights belonging to the neuron 2. And the third row means these are the weights belonging to the neuron 3. Well, what would then the columns mean? Well, the column 1 would mean these are the weights that actually multiply the neuron 1 of the previous layer. And the column 2 would mean, well, these are the weights that are multiplying neuron 2 in the previous layer. Where else can you find the shape of our weight and activation matrices? Well, you can see it in our naming strategy that we did previously. As you can see with gray, now I marked all the weights, and with green, I mark all the activations. As you can see, their shape perfectly matches to what we achieved when we noted which are the weights and activations of our neural network. Well, now we can actually replace three times one vector on the top as the matrix product of two matrices, one having weights and one having activations. Here we have explicit all the elements of our vectors and matrices, but let's now try to symbolize them by just using variables. So to represent the vector containing all the weighted sums, we can use the vector Z bold. So this is Z of the layer two. The weight matrix we can symbolize with a capital W of the layer two. Activations of the first layer we can symbolize with a small letter A. 
and the biases of the second layer we can symbolize with the letter B, and denoting to which layer does this B belong to. And now let's try to express an equality by using these symbols. Well, we can see that Z of the layer 2 is equal to the matrix product of the W of the layer 2 times A of the layer 1 plus B of the layer 2. So to get all the weighted sums of the layer 2, you need to do a matrix product of all the weights of the layer 2 with the vector containing all the activations of the layer 1, and to this matrix product add all the biases of the layer 2. Once we computed the weighted sums of the layer 2, we can now compute the activations, which come after them. Well, to compute the activations of the layer 2, we will also use the old picture of our neural network. There we have n1 is equal to the sigmoid of p1, n2 is equal to the sigmoid of p2, and n3 is the sigmoid of the p3. Well, now we just need to rename the elements as we did already. So instead of n1, n2, and n3, now we have that a1 of the layer 2 is equal to the sigmoid of z1 of the layer 2, a2 of the layer 2 is equal to the sigmoid of the z2 of layer 2, and a3 of the layer 2 is equal to the sigmoid of the z of the layer 2. As before, let's try to write this down in terms of vectors. So we have a vector containing all of the activations of the layer 2 is simply equal to the vector which contains the sigmoid function of all the weighted sums of the layer 2. Well, we can rename this. We can define a sigmoid function which takes actually vector inputs and then which takes all of the elements of this vector and applies a sigmoid function on it. So we can actually do this very easily in NumPy. Now we can symbolize these vectors by using variables. So A of the L2 would be a vector containing all of the activations of the layer 2. And on the right side, we have the sigmoid of the Z of the L2, which is the sigmoid activation function applied to the vector containing all of the weighted sums of the layer 2. Well, the useful thing is that in the last step, we have already computed what is this vector Z of L2. This vector was equal to W of the layer 2 times A of the layer 1 plus B of the layer 2. And we can now replace it in our formula. And then we get that to compute the activations of the layer 2, we just need to apply the activation function, in this case sigmoid, to a matrix product of all of the weights of the layer 2 with all of the activations of the layer 1 and add to it all the biases of the layer 2. And this is how we get all of the activations. Well, the nice thing about this formula is that we can now easily apply it to compute the activations of the layer 3. This was the old formula, and let's see what this old formula told us in terms of our naming scheme. Well, it told us that we should multiply the weights of the layer 2 by the activations of the layer 1, marked in green here, and add to this resulting vector all the biases of the layer 2. Well, in order to change our formula now to work for activations of the layer 3, we just need to update the indexes of our layers. We need to, to add 1 to the indexes of our layers. So to get the activations of the layer 3, we now need to multiply the weights of the layer 3 times the activations of the layer 2 plus biases of the layer 3. We can now display all the elements of this equality. We have the weight matrix of the layer 3, we have the activation matrix of the layer 2, and we have the bias vector of the layer 3. Well, if you're interested to see what elements are added and multiplied with which elements, in this formula we can expand it, and we can then display which weights are there in our weight matrix, which activations are they multiplying, and which biases are added to this product. But the most important thing that we achieved here is we found a way to compute activations for any layer L. So to compute the activation vector of the layer L, you just need to apply the activation function on a matrix product of all the weights of the layer L multiplied by all the activations of the layer before L, and add to it all the biases of the layer L. And that's it. By using one formula, you can get all of the activations of a certain layer. Let's now try to do this in Python. We are still in the exercise number 11, and now we go to the part which is about neural networks architecture and data set. And this is the architecture that we are going to implement, now using our new naming convention. The data set is defined by the variables data and labels. We will just load them up. There is a function to plot our data, and as you can see, this is exactly the same data as we have been using so far. So now, the task is to initialize neural network layers. So first we will do weights. You can see here where the weights 
are located within our network. So since the layer 2 has 3 neurons, you can see them here, and the layer 1 has 2 neurons, or 2 activations, then this matrix will be of the size 3 times 2. And you can see all the weights here organized in a matrix uh, W of the L2. The task is, by using the NumPy's function random n, encode the matrix W of the layer 2, fill it with normally distributed random values, and store it in a variable W2. So what we did before, we used numpy.random.randn to, to, to instantiate, for example, five random numbers. Well, this argument here actually determines the shape of our final array. So if we plug numbers 3, 2, we will actually get a matrix. So this is called an array here, but it actually represents a matrix containing three rows and two columns. And all of the numbers are actually random numbers, which are initialized from a normal distribution. Well, now we have actually all the weights of the layer 2. We just need to assign them to the variable, and we should use the variable w2. So w underscore 2 is going to be equal to this. All right. Now we are dealing with the layer 3. So the layer 3 has two neurons, and the previous layer L2 has three neurons, thus three activations. So the weight matrix W of the layer 3 will be of the size 2 times 3. And you can see here all the elements and how they are organized. So this is the first neuron of the layer 3, this is the second neuron of the uh, layer 3. And the first column just multiplies the activation of the neuron 1, activation of the neuron 2, and activation of the neuron 3. Now it says encode the matrix WL3 fill it with normal distributed random values and store it in a variable w3. So w3 is equal to mp.random.randn and the shape is 2,3 and let's plot it. And there you go. We have created this weight matrix in only a single line of code. Very simple. Now we have biases. We have biases of the layer L2. So the, since the layer 2 has 3 neurons, then this matrix or this vector will be of the size 3 times 1. So this is the bias vector or matrix, however you want to call it. And then it says by using the NumPy's function random rand n, encode the vector b, fill it with normally distributed random values and store it in a variable b2. So we can do this. b2 is just going to be equal to mp.random.rand n, and we will put the shape 3,1. And there you go. As you can see, this has the same shape as, as this. You have three rows and a single column. Now let's tackle the biases of the layer L3. So since the third layer has two neurons, it will also have two biases. Okay, encode the vector B of the layer 3, fill it with normal distributed random values, and store it in a variable B3. So B3 is equal to mp random rand n, and the shape is 2,1. And there you go. It matches the specification. And now let's tackle the activations. Well, all activations are computed in the forward pass except for the first one. The first activation, as you know, are our data points. So neuron 1 and 2 of the layer 1 actually contains our data points. So x coordinate and 1 y coordinate. So activations of the layer 1, we should have two of them. That's right. And it says uh, encode the vector a of the layer 1, fill it with the coordinates of the first data point and store it in a variable a1. You can use array, reshape, or transpose functions, which we did at the beginning of the class, to actually do this. So let's see what we have. We have data, and we will take the first data point. So data, zero. All right, now we have this data point, 1,2 and 0 0.7. And then we want to uh, convert it in a data structure, which represents a vector or a matrix, which has two rows and one column. So we can reshape it. We can say reshape and we will have two rows and one column. And then you have it. And now we just need to store this in the variable a1. Okay, a1 is equal to this. And let's plot it. That's fine. So now we need to tackle activations of the layer 2. We need to actually compute them. We do not have them. And it says, first, compute the weighted sums. Okay. To compute the weighted sums of the layer L2, uh, we can use the following formula. So this is when everything is expanded. And this is actually the formula given in terms of uh, variables. 
So Z2 of the layer 2 is equal to W of the layer 2 times A of the layer 1 plus B of the layer 2. So it says compute the vector containing the weighted sums of the layer 2 and store it in the variable Z2. So let's try to do this. So we have here, we have a matrix product. Yeah. So we will use the, the command MP that dot, so dot product, which is actually matrix product in NumPy, if we use matrices. And we have the weight matrix, which is W of the layer 2, so W2, comma, we multiply it by the activation matrix of the previous layer, so A1, which are actually our data points, okay? So this gives us 3 times 1 uh, vector or matrix, and then we add to it biases of the layer 2. So we need to add biases of the layer 2. Okay, we got it. So we just need to assign this to the variable z2. So z2 is equal to this thing. There you have it. So these are now the weighted sums of the layer 2. So to compute the activations of the layer 2, we just need to apply sigmoid activation to the matrix z. So this z2, we just need to apply sigmoid to it. Yeah, And it says to do this, we need to be able to compute the sigmoid of all of these elements individually. So, sigmoid of this, sigmoid of this, sigmoid of this. So we need to uh, define our sigmoid function so that it accepts vector input. Well, if we do this using NumPy, this will happen automatically. So now NumPy is smart enough to know that when we give it vector input, it should apply the operation to all the elements within a vector. So, def sigmoid of x so this will be return 1 divided by, in parentheses, very important, 1 plus numpy exponential function of negative x. So what I just told you, if you use the numpy function within your function, then this will guarantee you that it will work also on vectors. Yeah. So let's try if this is working. So sigmoid of 0 should give you 0 0.5, that's correct, of a large number should give you a number close to 1, that's fine. But now let's see what happens when you uh, feed it with an array, so mp.array containing multiple numbers. So 1, 2, 3, or 1, 2, 4. So we get actually sigmoid applied to all of the elements of this array, that's great. Okay. Now it says, compute the activations of the second layer, A, of the layer 2, and store it in a variable A2. So we just need to take this Z2 and store and apply a sigmoid function to it. So sigmoid of the whole layer Z2. Well, as you can see now, all of these numbers, we apply a sigmoid function to it. Yeah. So we just need to store this in the variable A2. A2. And there you have it. We now have the activations for the layer 2. And now the next task is activations of the layer 3. So to compute the activations, we just need to apply the same formula, we just need to update the indexes. So this used to be L2, now it's going to be L3. This used to be L2, now it's L3. This used to be L1, now it's L2. And this used to be L2, uh, L2 now it's L3. So let's do this. So Z3, Z3 is going to be equal to W of the layer 3, and then dot product, or matrix product in this case, A2 plus B3. And there you have it. We have now the activations of the third layer, just by applying the same formula as we did it before. Yeah? We just updated the indexes. Now it says to compute the final activation, we already know what we need to do. We just need to apply the sigmoid function to this whole layer of weighted sums. So, A3 is going to be equal to sigmoid of Z3. And there you have it. Now we have completed the forward pass, and now we need to go into the cost function. Well, now we need to compute the cost or loss of our neural network. And we will compute the loss or cost by using the mean squared error function. Well, the mean squared error is defined by uh, subtracting the label uh, associated with our data points from the last activation of our neural network and then squaring the result of the subtraction. So to compute C1, we need to subtract the first component of our label 
from the first activation of the layer 3, which means belonging to the first neuron, and for the C2 we just need to do the same, but just use second neuron. And to compute the total cost, we just need to add C1 and C2. So if they are numbers, we just need to add these two numbers together and we get a number which represents the total cost or how bad or good our neural network is doing for this data sample. Well, how to represent this in terms of vectors? Well, we can put C1 and C2 in a vector. And then we have two other vectors. One is containing the activations of the last layer and one is containing all the components of our label. We just need to subtract one from the other and square it. Well, then with the variable capital C, we can symbolize the vector containing the components of our cost. Uh, with A of the L3, we can symbolize all the activations of the layer 3. And with Y bold, we can symbolize all the components of our labels. And we just need to write C is equal to A of the L3 minus Y squared. And then to compute the total cost, whatever numbers you have in that vector, you just need to add them together. So let's do this in Python. The data point that we were using to compute the forward pass contains coordinates 1,2 and 0 0.7. This means that this is the first data point, and this data point is associated with the label 1. Let's check if this is true. So labels, we have the list of labels, and then let's just check the label with the index 0, and it tells us yes, this is the label 1. Okay, this works. As we have seen in the previous case, when we have a network which has two outputs, and we need to use it to classify two classes of points, we need to express that something is either blue or, or something is red by using two numbers. Well, then we can use the first neuron to represent the probability that the point is red or that it has label 1, and we can use the second neuron to express the probability that the point is blue or that it has the label 0. So, Previously, to achieve this, we used this function convert label. So if the label was 1, we returned it to two numbers. One is telling us the probability that the point is 1, and the second one is giving, returning us the probability that the point is of the label 0. And if the label was 0, then the first number will correspond to the probability of its being 1, which is in this case 0, and the probability of being 0, which is in this case 1. If it is not clear for you what this means, please look at the lecture number 6. So we have the function convert label, and if we do convert label of the label 1, we get the probabilities that the label is 1 is high, which is maximum, and the probability that the label is 0 is minimal. If we do the convert label of 0, we get that the probability that the label is 1 is low, and the probability that the label is uh, 0 is very high. So now it says redefine the function convert label to output column vectors of probabilities. What does this mean? Well, these are so-called tuples. As you can see, tuples are just ordered list of two numbers. And we should actually return vectors. So we should return the vector containing 1 and 0 and vector containing 0 and 1. So we just need to kind of modify this convert label function to do this for us. So how can we do this? Well, instead of returning 1 and 0, we can return an array, which will then be equal to the vector containing 1 and 0. So array and we feed it with the elements 1 and 0. And if the label is 0, we should return an array containing 0 and 1. OK, so let's test it. If we now convert label 1, we get 1 and 0. And if we convert label 0, we get 0 and 1. But what we really want, we want column vectors. We do not want row vectors like this, so we need to uh, either reshape this thing, or this is maybe easier to do, just put it in additional pair of squared brackets. Yeah, so let's try that now. Okay, now we get actually column vectors with zeros and ones. Great. Now it says convert the label associated with the first data point and store it in the variable y. So labels, 0, and we feed it into convert label. And then we should store it in the variable y. So y is equal to this, and we get the result. So, so 
again, we will be using quadratic cost function, and this is how we used to compute it before. Compute it before. So we subtracted the first component of our label, which is in this case 1, from the output of the first neuron, and the second component we subtracted from the second neuron. Okay, but here it says we can represent this in terms of vectors. So this thing in terms of components is the same as if we subtracted two vectors and then found the length of this subtraction and found the length of the result of this subtraction and then squared this length. So how can we actually achieve this? So we have here activations of the layer 3. And let's also now represent Y, which are the labels. So as you can see, these are the labels and these are the activations. And they are of the same size, therefore we can subtract them. So we can do this. A3 minus Y. So now this is the cost for the first neuron and this is the cost for the second neuron. But since we are doing mean square error, this means that we need to square the error. So this is the error and we need it squared. So we, we can just do this. We can just multiply this expression by itself using a Hadamard product. Hadamard product means element-wise multiplication, which means that the resulting vector will have the same size. And this is now our C1 and this is our C2. So this is the cost of the first neuron and cost of the second neuron. And if we want to add these elements, we can just use the NumPy function sum, so mp the sum, and put this thing in the parentheses. And then this is the actual cost, and we should just store it in the variable tc. So tc, and there it is. So we have now successfully completed our forward pass. Now it is time to do the backward pass. And as we did before, our strategy is to compute the partial derivatives in terms of the crucial points within this graph, which are the weighted sums. So here we have five crucial points because we have five weighted sums. So let's start by computing the partial derivatives of the total cost in terms of the weighted sums of the layer 3. So these two expressions that we see here, this is something that we have computed two classes ago, and these are exactly the same expressions, except that they are now represented in terms of our new naming strategy. So nothing new here. And let's see what elements do we have here. So in the gray, we have partial derivatives of the total cost in terms of the final outputs. So the final outputs of our neural network. And now marked in green, we have partial derivatives of final outputs in terms of the weighted sums. And since we use the sigmoid activation function, we know that the derivative of sigmoid function is the output of the sigmoid times one minus the output of the sigmoid. In this case, a1 times one minus a1 for both neurons. Now to compute the gradient in terms of the weighted sums, we have our two expressions, and ultimately we want to represent them in terms of vectors. But we have some elements here which are represented in a very complicated way, so let's rename some of these elements. So we can rename the partial derivatives of the total cost in terms of the weighted sums of L3 as delta 1 of L3 and delta 2 of L3. This is now much easier to look at than all of those partial derivatives with fractions. So now if we extract one element, for example delta 1 of the L3, this just means that this element is a partial derivative of the total cost in terms of the weighted sum of the first neuron of the third layer. Now we can try to represent these elements in terms of vectors. So let's see how many vectors do we have. We have vector containing the weighted sums, we have vector containing activations of the layer 3, we have vector containing our labels, we have vector containing only once, and now let's see how we can represent this to equalities in terms of vector equality. So we have a vector containing weighted sums is equal to two times vector containing activations minus vector containing labels, and then we have vector containing activations, vector containing once minus vector containing activations. So the only thing that we do not know yet is which operation should we use to multiply these vectors. Well, let's first make sure that these are actually vectors. Well, all of these elements are actually of the size 2 times 1. So they have two rows and one column. And which vector operations do we have that preserve the sizes of our vectors? Well, we have vector addition, we have vector subtraction, and we have element-wise multiplication all or the Hadamard product. So actually we should use Hadamard product to multiply these vectors to get the 
equality that we have on the top. Okay, so how can we represent this in terms of symbols? So we can use the symbols delta of the layer 3, we can use the symbol 2, which is just a scalar, we can use symbol um, A of the layer 3 to represent all the activations of the layer 3, we can use the symbol Y to represent all the components of our labels, we can use one to represent a vector containing only ones. And finally, we are able to express this as a vector equality. So marked in gray, we have partial derivatives of the total cost in terms of the final outputs, as before, and marked in green, we have partial derivatives of final outputs in terms of the weighted sums. We are finished with computing the gradient in terms of the weighted sums of the layer 3. Let's now compute the gradient in terms of the weighted sums of the layer 2. I will be using the same animation that I used two classes ago to show you how to compute the gradient. So to compute the partial derivatives of the total cost in terms of the weighted sum of the first neuron in the second layer, we need to take into consideration that this neuron branches out into the two neurons in the next layer. Because of this branching, we need to add all the paths that lead to this neuron. So one path goes over Z1 of the layer 3 and one path goes over Z2 of the layer 3. To compute the partial derivative of the total cost in terms of the weighted sum Z2 of the layer 2, we again need to take into consideration that this neuron branches and that we will have two paths that we need to add together. One goes over Z1 and one goes over Z2 of the layer 3. Finally, to compute the partial derivative of the total cost in terms of the weighted sum Z3 of the layer 2, we need to take into account this branching into the next layer. This means that we need to take into consideration two paths, one going over Z1 of the layer 3 and one going over Z2 of the layer 3. Let's just collect all of these equations and put them together. So what we represented here looks very, very complicated, so we need to start by simplifying it a little bit, simplifying the notation. So we will start by renaming some of the elements which represent partial derivatives in terms of the weighted sums. We will rename them by using the symbol delta. Well, now our expressions look a, bit, a little bit simpler, but let's see what else can we do here. So what we already know is that we computed the blue elements in our last step, so we have them. But what we need yet to compute are these yellow elements, and we need to apply chain rule to these elements. Let me first show you which elements are these. So let's simplify these elements further by applying chain rule to them. So now we have a very hairy expression on the right, so we need to make sure that we know which elements do we have there. So I will now go through all of the elements in our three equations, just for you to realize that there is nothing really complicated going on there. All of these steps we already know how to do. Let's first compute the derivatives of the elements marked in green. We have already done this before. The partial derivative of the weighted sum in terms of the activation is just the element that multiplies the activation, and these elements are weights. So since we are already interested in computing the partial derivatives in terms of activations, the results will be all weights. So let's replace these green elements with symbols. Another thing that we need to note is that marked with dark green, we have one and the same group of elements. When you see it on the left, you can see that arrows going from activations towards weighted sums come in pairs, which are actually the one and same partial derivatives. So what can we do with these? Well, we can use the distributive property of multiplication to deal with this case. If you do not know what I'm talking about, let me show you. Let's take one of these equations. So what we will do is we will replace these complicated uh, variables with simple ones. A, B, C, D, E, F. So every time we see a new expression, we will replace it with a different variable. When we see the same variable repeating, we will use the variable that we have already used before. So I see delta 1 of L3, this is now going to be A. W11 is going to be B, because it's a new variable. Then we again have a new variable, I will replace it with C. Again we have a new variable, I will replace it with D. Again we have a new variable, I will replace it with E. And finally, we have a variable which is repeating, which is the same as C. So we will name it C, because it's the same as the C before. And now we need to add them together. So we have A times B times C plus D 
times e times c. So what is this thing equal to? So we can use the distributive property of multiplication to represent this as c multiplying the sum of a times b and d times e. This is something that we'll learn early in school. It's just that the equation at the top looks so complicated with this naming scheme that we are not actually realizing it's actually quite simple what's going on. So what I want to achieve is, you see now on the left side of this equation, I have c repeating two times. And what I want to achieve is what happens on the right side, to have c only represented once, and then multiplying the sum of a, b, and d, e. So analogous to this, now on the left side I have these repeating elements, and I want to have them only once. So this is what I can do. So what are these elements anyway? Well, these elements are just partial derivatives of the activation in terms of the weighted sums. And what are the elements in the parentheses? Well, they are just the partial derivatives of the total cost in terms of the activations of the layer 2. Let's go back to our purple elements. Well, what they really represent is just the derivatives of the sigmoid function. And we know what is the derivative of the sigmoid function. It is output of the sigmoid times 1 minus output of the sigmoid. And what is the output of the sigmoid here? Well, the outputs are actually a1, a2, and a3 of the layer 2. So let's just represent them like that. We have expanded our three equalities, and now just let's try to write them down in terms of vectors. We will have vector containing partial derivatives of the total cost in terms of the weighted sum of the layer 2. We will have vector containing activations of the layer 2. We will have vector containing activations subtracted from the vector containing ones. And then we have a vector containing all of this multiplication and addition taking place in the last parenthesis. If we would like to make the equality in terms of vectors, we know that we need to use the Hadamard product here, because we are just multiplying these elements element-wise, they need to remain having the same dimensionality. Well, the only thing we need to do now is figure out what is happening in this last vector of ours. Well, I assume again that there is a matrix product taking place. We have 3 by 1 matrix, and the question is, if this is a product of matrices A and B, one containing weights and one containing partial derivatives in terms of the weighted sums, then what would be the size of the matrices A and B? Well, the first matrix would need to have three rows, and the second matrix would have to have one column. And we have six weights, and we have two deltas. Again, to represent this, we just need to pick the first matrix having three rows and two columns, and the second matrix having two rows and one column. And how do we put the elements here? Well, we just add them in a way that confirms the correct matrix multiplication, which we learned last time. Well, the only problem with this is that this weight matrix that we have written down is actually not a matrix W of the L3. Just for reference, this is actually the matrix W of the layer 3. These matrices have exactly the same elements, but they are ordered in a different way. Let's try to, to figure out how do they actually differ from each other. Well, the rows of the matrix of the left are the same as the columns of the matrix on the right. So what this tells us is that we can transpose the matrix on the left to get the matrix on the right. And this is something that we practice at the beginning of our class. So the matrix on the right is actually the transpose matrix containing all the weights of the layer 3. And the other matrix, delta of the L3, is the vector containing partial derivatives of the total cost in terms of the weighted sums of the layer 2. And we can now replace this matrix product in the upper equation. What other elements do we have there to symbolize? Well, we have delta of the layer 2, so vector containing partial derivatives of the total cost in terms of the weighted sums of the layer 2. We have a vector containing all the activations of the layer 2. And we have a vector in which we subtract all the activations of the layer 2 from the number 1. Now we can describe this as an equality and we get the following formula. We can generalize this formula to use it to compute the gradient in terms of the weighted sums of any layer which is not the final layer. Why not the final layer? Because final layer actually contains the cost function, so it is going to be a little bit different. This is what we already covered. But if we use this formula, we can compute the partial derivative of the total cost in terms of weighted sums of any other layer. And now let's just do this in Python. 
And now, in our exercise 11, we came to the part where we compute the backward pass. And first comes the cost function. So to compute the cost function, we need to subtract the vector containing labels from the activations of the final layer and then multiply it by 2. So let's do this. 2 times activations of the layer 3 minus our labels. And here we have the partial derivatives. Now it says we rename the partial derivatives of the total cost in terms of the weighted sums and store them in the following vectors. As you can see, vector containing partial derivatives of the weighted sums of the layer 3 has two rows, and the one containing partial derivatives of the total cost in terms of the weighted sums of the layer 2 has three rows. And now we come to the part where we compute the derivatives of the weighted sums in the output layer, which is L3. And now we just need to apply this formula that we have just derived in our slides. So what do we need to do? So we have a couple of elements and I will introduce them one by one. So we have the activations of the third layer minus our labels. So A3 minus Y. Okay, then we multiply this by scalar 2. This scalar will multiply both of these components. So 2 times this scalar. Okay. Then we have a Hadamard product, which is just multiplication in uh, Python times the activations of the layer 3, times 1 minus activations of the layer 3. So just times A3 times 1 minus A3. We just need to store it in a variable delta 3. So delta 3 is equal to this. There you have it. And now computing the derivatives of the weighted sums in the hidden layer or the layer L2, we just need to apply this formula that we have derived in our slides. So what do we have here? We have activations of the layer 2, okay? So this is the actual output of the layer 2. We multiplied by 1 minus the output of the layer 2. As we know, this is now the actual derivative of the sigmoid function, okay? And then we multiply this by the dot product or the matrix product, in this case, of the matrix containing all the weights of the layer 3 transposed, so W3 transposed, and partial derivatives of the cost in terms of the weighted sums of the layer 3, which is delta 3, which we computed beforehand. This now gives us three partial derivatives in terms of the weighted sums of the layer 2. So as you can see, there are three of them. And we just need to store them in the variable delta 2. So delta 2 is equal to this. Okay, that's it. Well, now that we know partial derivatives in terms of these five strategic points, we can use these partial derivatives to easily compute partial derivatives of the total cost in terms of our weights and biases. This is a strategy that we actually introduced two classes ago. So if you want to remind yourself, please watch this lecture. Let's see what would be the gradient in terms of the biases. Well, the first thing that we need to realize is that we want to actually update our weights and biases. And our weights and biases are stored in matrices or in vectors. So to update the matrix containing weights or biases, we need to subtract from it a matrix that contains partial derivatives in terms of these same weights or biases. And to do that, these matrices or vectors need to be of the same size, otherwise you cannot subtract them one from another. Let's look at the layer 3 and the biases of the layer 3. So the vector containing biases of the layer 3 contains two biases, B1 and B2 of the layer 3. If we want to update these biases, then we need to have partial derivatives in terms of these biases, and they need to be stored in the same data structure in which we store biases. So this means that the matrix or the vector containing partial derivatives in terms of biases need to be of the exact same size and have the respective elements that we can subtract them. Because to update biases, we need to compute B new in terms of B old. And B old and B new need to be of the same size in order to do this. So to update these biases, we compute B new is equal to B old minus the derivatives of B times the step size, as we have been doing since the beginning. So to be able to do this subtraction, B old of the L3 minus delta B of the L3, these two vectors need to be of the exactly same size. 
since we now know what size this vector containing partial derivatives in terms of the biases of the layer 3 should be, we can just represent it what partial derivatives go into computing these elements. So in the layer 3, we will have a vector of the size 2 times 1 containing partial derivatives of the biases. And the layer 2, we will have 3 times 1 vector containing partial derivatives of the total cost in terms of the biases. And now let's apply the chain rule to these elements, but in terms of the gradients of the weighted sums that we already have. And the elements that we have already pre-computed in terms of the layer 3 are delta 1 and delta 2 of the layer 3. And the pre-computed elements of the layer 2 are delta 1 of the layer 2, delta 2 of the layer 2, and delta 3 of the layer 2. Well, let's now visualize all of the elements of these two vectors. The elements that I marked in green are the elements that we have already pre-computed before, so we know them. So let's now concentrate all the blue elements. Well, blue elements represent partial derivatives of the weighted sums in terms of the bias term. And what do we know about these elements? Well, we know that all of them are going to be equal to 1, because the bias terms are added to the weighted sum by means of addition, and the partial derivatives in terms of the addition is just equal to 1. So all of these elements are just going to disappear. Well, now we are left with two vectors, but they are expressed in terms of the weighted sums of the layers 3 and 2, which actually tells us that the bias derivative vectors are the same as weighted sum derivative vectors. So we can just say that the vector containing partial derivatives of the biases of the layer 3 is the same as the vector containing partial derivatives of the weighted sums of the layer 3. Consequently, the vector containing partial derivatives of the biases of the layer 2 is the same as the vector containing partial derivatives of the weighted sums of the layer 2. So this was fairly easy. Let's now compute the gradient in terms of the weights of the layer 3. Well, what we already know is that the matrix containing all the partial derivatives of the weights of the layer 3 needs to be exactly of the same size as the matrix containing the weights of the layer 3, which is two rows and three columns, so six elements. And the elements in this matrix are just partial derivatives in terms of the same weights. Well, we can easily visualize partial derivative contained in this matrix. Now, let's apply chain rule to all of these six elements in terms of the gradients that we have already pre-computed in the last step. Now, instead of six elements, we have six products. So, 12 elements. Let's try to visualize what these 12 elements actually are. So, the green elements, we have already pre-computed them, so we know their values. So, the only thing that we need to figure out are these red elements there. And what are these red elements actually? Well, they are partial derivatives of the weighted sum in terms of our weights. And we already know what their derivatives are. Derivatives will be the values that these weights multiply, so the activations of the previous layer. Let's just replace these elements by the activations, and we get this new, much simpler matrix. So the only thing that we need to figure out is what is actually happening in this matrix, what elements are involved, and what kind of operations. And I'm already assuming this is actually a matrix product. So let's do what we have been doing so far. So this is a 2 times 3 matrix, yeah. so it has 6 elements, it has 2 rows and 3 columns. So if this is a matrix product, A times B, what would be the size of the matrices A and B? Well, we know that the first matrix would need to have 2 rows, and the second matrix would need to have 3 columns. The question is, what is this middle element equal to? Well, we have 2 deltas and we have 3 A's. This just tells us that this middle element should be actually 1. So the first matrix should have one column and the second matrix should have one row. So let's display these matrices first. And now how should we fill these matrices? Well, I'm assuming since the first matrix has only two placeholders that I should actually put delta 1 and delta 2 in it. And since the second matrix has three placeholders, I will put a1, a2 and a3 in it. And as you can see, if I actually multiply these two matrices, I do get the expression above. 
And let's now symbolize these elements. So the first vector or a matrix can be symbolized by delta of the L3. But what is this second vector or matrix about? We haven't seen it so far. Well, this is just the vector containing all of the activations of the layer 2. But they are not represented as a column vector, but as a row vector. And we already know that we have an operation called matrix transpose, which will shift rows into columns and columns into rows. So we can say that this matrix containing A1, A2, and A3 of the layer 2 is just a transpose matrix A of the layer 2. So we can now replace the upper expression with this matrix multiplication. What we are left to do is symbolize the matrix containing all the partial derivatives in terms of the weights of the layer 2, and we can just display this as an equality. So to compute all the partial derivatives of the weights of the layer L3, we need to do a matrix multiplication of a vector containing partial derivatives in terms of the weighted sums of the layer 3 and the transpose vector containing all the activations of the layer 2. So we can now reuse the same formula to compute the gradient in terms of the weights in the layer L2. So now to compute the partial derivatives of all the weights in the layer 2, we just need to do a matrix product of two matrices, or vectors in this case, one containing partial derivatives in terms of the weighted sums of the layer 2, and the other containing the activations of the layer 1 transposed. If we would like to expand all the elements of this equation, this is how we can represent them. Finally, we can reuse this expression to compute the gradient in terms of weights of any layer. It's just we will now replace L of any specific layer with simply L, and L minus 1 would be the layer before it. So if you have 10 layers, then L could be 9, and L minus 1 would be simply 8. And now let's just finish this off in Python. So now our task is to compute the derivatives of the biases in the output layer, which is L3. Okay, we already know that we have delta 3, which has a partial derivatives in terms of weighted sums of the layer 3, and that the vector containing biases of the same layer will have exactly the same elements as these weighted sums. So B, I will call it DB3, as we are told to do, is equal to delta 3. So DB3. Okay, and now compute the derivatives of the biases of the hidden layer B2. Well, in the same way, we will use variable DB2, and we will know that the biases, that the partial derivatives of the biases of the layer 2 will be the same as partial derivatives of the weighted sums of the layer 2. So this will be equal to delta 2. And now let's compute the derivatives of the weights in the output layer uh, L3. So to do this, we already know what to do. So, so we need to do the matrix product. So MP dot, and we have delta 3. And we have activations of the previous layer, which is A2, transposed. And now in this single line of code, we have obtained all the partial derivatives in terms of the weights of the layer 3. So we just need to assign this to the variable DW3. DW3. And we have it. And now this same formula can be applied to compute the derivatives of the weights in the hidden layer 2. So I can just say that dw2 is going to be equal to mp dot of the delta 2 and the a1 transposed. And we have it. Again, we have six partial derivatives. And the nice thing now is that these are all the partial derivatives in terms of the weights of the layer 2. And if you look at the weights of the layer 2, they have exactly the same shape, so we can now subtract them yeah, in order to update our weights and biases. And this is actually the next part of our exercise 11. It says, updating the weights and biases of the neural network. Introduce the variable step size, initialize it with a small value, and up update the weights and biases. So this is simple, we did this 100 times already. So step size is equal to, for example, 0, 1. Yeah? And now we need to update the weights and biases. So how does this look? So we had, for example, x new was equal to x old. 
minus derivative of x yeah, times step size. This is how we minimize any function when we, have, when we know its derivative for a small amount uh, defined by step size. So what do we need to do now? Well, we need to minimize what? Let's do first the layer 3 and then we will do the layer 2. So in the layer uh, 3 we have weights of the layer 3. Yeah? So we have W3 and we have biases of the layer 3, so B3. In the layer 2 we have weights of the layer 2 and we have biases of the layer 2. So we need to subtract, so we can do it like this, we can say e equals we um, w3 minus and then subtract the delta uh, w3, yeah? Or we can just say minus e equals delta w3 which is the same thing, and then we just need to multiply this by the step size. So it's going to be the same for the biases. We just need to subtract the derivatives of the biases. So db3 times step size. And for the layer 2 we have exactly the same thing. So here we have, uh, we subtract the derivatives of the layer 2 times step size and here we subtract derivatives of the biases of the layer 2 so db2 times step size and we can get rid of this thing let's run it and it looks like there are no problems that's nice so what we want to achieve with this training is that our network outputs the value as close as possible to the label which the data is associated with. So print the current label. So our current label is y. Yeah, 1 and 0. And it says print the activation layer and it says print the activation vector of the last layer. So this will be activation of the layer 3. We have three layers. Okay. Now it says compute the new activation of the last layer by computing the forward pass again with the updated weights and biases. Well, what does this mean? Well, we have our output of our neural network and we have already updated our weights and biases, so our weights and biases are updated to minimize the total cost, yeah? So what we need to do is simply run the forward pass once again and see the new cost and compare it to the old cost to see if we improved or not. So let's compute our updated weights and biases. So to get the activations of the layer 2, what do we do? Well, we have a sigmoid of what? So we have a dot product, mp dot, of the weights of the layer 2 with the activations of the layer 1 and we add to it biases of the layer 2. Is this working? Yes, it is. So let's now compute the activations of the last layer. So a3, we'll just reuse the same formula. So sigmoid of mp dot of the weights now of the layer 3 and the activations of the layer 2 plus plus the biases of the layer 3 and there you have it we have computed the activations of the last layer and now it says compute the cost loss and store it in the variable tc new well we already computed the cost and loss before so where is it here it is so we computed the cost it is just equal to the one vector minus the other and then computing the length of this vector, which you do by squaring these components, and then you get the total cost by adding all the components of this resulting vector. So we can now reuse this thing. So the total cost will be this sum, but it says now store it in the variable uh, tc new. Why? Because I don't want to overwrite the old uh, cost, I will then not know what, what it was before. I want to compute it with the old cost. So I will call it TC new. Yeah. And now I have TC old and TC new. It now it tell, and now it asks me to compare the old cost with the new cost. So let's do that. So TC old is just TC and TC new is next to it. 
And now we see that the old cost used to be 0 0.694 and the new cost is 0 0.478. So the new cost is definitely smaller than the last, which means that we effectively minimize the loss of our neural network, which means that we got to a step where our network is doing better than it used to do before in classifying two sets of points. So that's it for this exercise. So now we know all the individual steps and we can create a neural network algorithm which is implemented uh, truly in the spirit of linear algebra by using uh, vectors and matrices. In the next class we will actually implement the fully working algorithm. But the problem is that this algorithm is specific to the size of the neural network that we chose. So it has two neurons in the input layer, three neurons in the hidden layer, and two neurons in the output layer. So what we really want is a more flexible neural network where we can define what kind of architecture that we, we want in the start, so we can say how many layers we want and how many neurons per layer we want to have. And this is also something that we will do in the next class. So until then, I hope you enjoyed this class, I hope you learned something, I hope you had some fun, and you feel that there is something about this linear algebra which is powerful. So see you next time and goodbye.